Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jen Hicks. I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach with Maine Woodland Owners. We're a state organization that provides the uh, support and uh, expertise for woodland owners in Maine. We are um, here today to talk about the legislative session. Um, as if you've read in our newsletter, we've been tracking, um, we've been tracking how they've been operating as a leg legislature in the time of COVID. It's been very strange, but nonetheless, our executive director, Tom Doak has been following all the bills that have been, um, that are of impact to uh, woodland owners in Maine and forestry in general. And we have Tom here today to talk about where we are with the legislature, what to be keeping an eye on and where um, members and woodland owners uh, can help to uh, let the legislators know what, what's best for woodland owners and uh, where they can um, voice their, their opinions and their um, concerns about uh, bills that have come up this year during the legislature. So, um, and I'll just repeat one more time. If you, uh, this is a, Tom will do a presentation with his information and then um, there'll be time for questions. But if you have questions during his presentation, you can go ahead and type those questions in the chat box or you can turn your video on and you can raise your hand and I'll uh, call on you and have you ask your question or you can wait at the end and jump in with your questions for Tom uh, at the end of the session. So I don't think there's anything else I need to uh, let anybody know. I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, this, because it's uh, recorded, this will be available on our website uh, probably by tomorrow. So if you know anybody who wanted to be here but couldn't, uh, let them know that this uh, video will be on our legislative action page um, tomorrow. So Tom, the floor is yours. I will Great, pass the mic over. So I have, a, I think there's eight or nine topics to talk about here. Um, and then if someone, if I don't touch on something that someone has a question about, you know, we can talk about, if we have time at the end, we'll talk about those. Um, it is a little strange session because everything's on Zoom. I was, I was just on a hearing, actually it's going on right now that I'm waiting to testify on. Um, and we'll, I'll talk about that bill. So everything's being done remotely. So it's very different, uh, very difficult to kind of interact with legislators the same way that normally do. And so I think it's a strange thing for those legislators and for everybody. Um, I want to start with a conversation around the trickle tax law program. If you're in the, I don't, I assume perhaps some of you are in the trickle tax law program. There's always a bill, there's a few topics that are always up the legislature. One of them is the trickle tax law. There's two bills um, pending or, that are, that are in play right now at the legislature. Um, the one of most concern, I think, to most folks is L, um, LD-1283, which is a bill that says, if you uh, restrict public access in any way, shape, or form, if you're in the Trico Tax Law Program, uh, you are removed and uh, penalties paid. That bill um, was scheduled for a public hearing. Um, it is, has not had his hearing yet. Uh, it was the sponsor is John Martin from uh, Eagle Lake. And some of you may know John has had some medical issues. So that hearing's been postponed, the bill's printed. It's the same bill that was um, last year was uh, brought forward and um, sat at the legislature. It didn't get a final vote in the legislature because they adjourned and the bill died. So that bill is back. Um, looking at, I was looking at the schedule of uh, the taxation committee and that bill hasn't even been has not yet been scheduled uh again rescheduled and they should be adjourning supposedly by the end of june so it's, we'll see when that's going to come up but it could come up at any time um and we're obviously opposed to that bill the other tree growth bill is an is interesting one um it basically says if you if you violate uh, if the if a if a trucker who's hauling wood for you violates the laws regarding uh, foreign workers moving wood, and essentially there's a there's a law that says um, uh, some foreign workers can do anything an American worker do, and some foreign workers can only bring things in and take them out. Um, but there's a bill that says if you if the trucker violates is in violation of the laws that regulate 
who can move what wood products. And you're in the Trigo tax law program, all your land comes out of it. Uh, it's aimed largely at land, large landowners, obviously. Um, um, it, would, it was essentially um, Canadian uh, work, uh, log, uh, truckers, but it kind of ties credible penalty into uh, the Trigo tax law program. And so that bill uh, actually was voted out of committee yesterday, I think, at taxation, the day before. But we haven't seen the final language, but it does have a provision in there that does tie it into tree growth. Uh, probably not a big problem for most smaller owners, but the, our objection is that you're taking something that has nothing to do with the tree growth tax law program and tying it to something. Um, so I, I don't know where that will go, um, but it did come out of the committee, I think, on a, I think it was probably a straight party vote. Um, but those two bills uh, are the two on tree growth. There was, I thought there was a third one. It looked like there would be a third one, but we haven't seen it yet. There's still, they still can print bills. So we have possibly, we may not have seen them all. So um, that's it on the tree growth. Um, tree growth. Um, Jen, should I take a question now on that one or not? Sure. Uh, who, does anybody have any questions? Any question in the chat? Is there any question in the, by anybody? Jump in. <clears throat> oh. okay okay i'll keep going um one of the other topics that we hear about all the time is sunday hunting you've probably been hearing about that one um it's been this is the 35th time in 45 years that there's been a bill in the legislature on sunday hunting there are three bills actually um two of them say you can hunt uh under uh Anybody, you can hunt on Sunday if you are the landowner or, or give written permission to somebody. The, the other bill says every you can hunt, anybody can hunt north of Route 2 and Route 9, essentially the northern two-thirds of the state, I guess. Um, those have had the hearings. Um, it's fairly it, kind of an interesting thing on the, the landowner part of it. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, it's been proposed as well. This doesn't affect landowners because if you don't want it, people want it, you don't just don't get permission. Of course, not everybody knows where the boundary lines are, and and uh, you have to assume that that on Sunday that somebody that somebody may be on your land. Um, um, the other interesting thing is uh, this would be the first time in history that a hunter in Maine would have to get permission from a landowner, and um, I'm guessing this then turns into seven days a week. Uh, permission instead of one day, but it, it's designed to um, um, get landowners not to object to getting some kind of Sunday hunting. It's not being even supported by the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine, so it's essentially being driven by out-of-state groups that want to change the, the hunting regulations in, in Maine. Um, but this is a serious issue. Uh, this is a serious attempt on Sunday hunting. I mean, we have always supported hunting and the expansion and uh but we've always opposed sunday as the day that you know that everybody gets a chance to enjoy their land and not thinking about someone on their land um but this is uh the first this is the most serious uh attempt i would say that we've seen in the last maybe 10 years on on, on sunny hunting i mean there's hunting in maine 313 days uh, so some, there's open seasons on some things year round. So there's 313 hunting days. The, the uh, organizations that opposed it were the uh, uh, us, the Farm Bureau, the Dairy Industry Association, the Maine Guides, the ATV Maine, um, I may be missing some, and then uh, the Department uh, of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife opposed it. So those bills have had a hearing. Um, there's work session, at least one next week. Uh, I, it's gonna be a split vote coming out of the committee and we'll see what happens from there. So it'll go to the full legislature. Um, and um, this, I think it will get messy. So um, if you care about this issue, you know, you, you should stay tuned. So is this one that anybody wants to talk about? Jump in, anybody who wants to ask a question or clarification. 
you can find my testimony on the bill on our, on our website. And um, you'll have our testimony on any any bill that we testified on. Richard, I think Richard yeah. Nass is, yeah. is, is trying to get in. Hi, Tom. This is Hi. Gina. How are you? Uh, Hi. So I, my state rep called me a couple of days ago, and uh, it's an interesting phenomenon in the legislature that uh, be subject to, and that was the once one of the parties gets behind something and it starts moving, you begin to lose uh, all, you begin to lose sense, I guess, of what the issues are. And so he, uh, he recognized that a lot of the Republicans are supporting this particular hunting yeah. issue, even though we've long opposed it. And uh, uh, I guess it, sh it shocked me, but it shouldn't because I've been there when it's this has happened. You know, you get you get sucked into a, a movement and you stop paying attention to the reasons for and against it. So I just wanted to mention that it's really important that people talk to their state rep about this and uh, have a good conversation because a lot of these things, you know, you lose track of what the pluses and minuses are. So I just thought I'd mention that. Betty. There was an interview on the news uh, with the legislator who's um, introduced who's introduced it, and and it's the same thing that Richard was saying, and it, it sounded like um, in my memory this is something about what he said about you know people should have the right to do what they want with their own land, and that is a pretty hot topic for um, right. for those folks. So is, is that what it comes down to? Is that the argument? Well, that's the, uh, that, I, I think that's one of the arguments. You know, the interesting thing, of course, is the, you, the landowner doesn't own the game. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things I can't do on my own land. Um, I can't, as I said to one of them, well, I can't go out deer hunting today on my own land. You know, so should I be able to go anytime I want to do what, you know, those kind of things. So, well, that's different. And I said, well, no, it isn't. It's the same thing. I don't have the right today to go. Um, so I think that's part, that's part of it. Um, you know, I think people are saying, well, yeah, that's, you should be able to do whatever you want on your own land. I mean, from a, as a hunter myself, I'm saying this is, well, what we're headed toward is landowner permission for seven days a week. And that's, you know, the whole, it's been a compromise. The reason there's no, in most states you have to go on, you have to get permission um, to, to hunt. And in Maine, you don't. It's the landowner has to keep you off, and the reason, and and then the, the the balance has been Sunday hunting. You lose that balance, and you're going to lose the whole kit and caboodle, which is why even the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine isn't in favor of this bill. Um, so, Betty, have you talked to your representative or your senator? No, but I will. Yeah, Scott Landry is our as our local guy, so. and probably Russell Black is your yeah, senator, Russell. right? Yeah, yeah, Russell is a sponsor of the bill. Oh. And he is telling me he's he thinks that uh, that uh, that we're not representing our members that our members would be in favor of this. So you might want to tell him you you have a different view. Yeah, how would he know that his members um, that the member? I mean, ha, ha, has he taken a poll or is he just assuming? Just how does he base that? What does he base that on? Um, I'm just uh, throwing that out, but I will contact every, him. Yeah, every 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 organization that testified in favor of it was asked. None of them testified. None, none of them testified in favor of it would ask this question. Everybody opposed was asked. Well, how do you know you represent your members? You know, and I said, well, I've done this 35 times in the last 45 years, but you know, we don't we haven't polled everybody because it's. I mean, I'm sure we have members that there's. We have members that would be in favor of it. I, there's no question that even the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine will tell you about 50% of them oppose Sonny Hunnick. So it's a very close, but in our case, it's not close. Um, but there are some people, I'm sure. But uh, they, there's legislators probably need to hear from some more of our members. And we'll be sending out a, when we know where the bill is going and what the, what the actual language is, we'll send out a big alert to all our members. It, that's why it's important to have your email address. Any other? Richard. Richard, I think. Yeah, just, just to continue this discussion, uh, you know, I've been through this a couple of times, including in the legislature, and the difficulty for me, I'm not a hunter, 
uh, nor is my wife. Um, but we have, we, despite that we've lived here on this land for 50 years, we have neighbors who have hunted this land a lot longer than we've been here. And so the dilemma for me is I'm going to have to tell them, uh, so I'm going to follow up on this, that there's not going to be any hunting on this thing because I'm not going to get permission. That's a tough neighbor to neighbor position to put me in. I don't want to be there. And, you know, we've encouraged people to hunt on this land. And no matter how I feel, I'm not going to be stuck in that position. So that's the dilemma. You know, you're going to have, I mean, I, the, the fascinating thing is um, the landowners are going to have, I, I think when the, when the average hunter understands what's, what's happening, you're not going to have access, those average hunters are not going to have access to the land. The, the, it's going to be the, the landowner. And so they won't have the hunting opportunity that others have. And so it's going to create this, this dynamic, you know, this have and the have nots in the hunting side. And it's kind of an odd situation. It's like the, it's like the king's, you know, the king gets to decide who, who's, who gets the hunter or, you know, that kind of thing or has the right to. And that, that's very different than we've ever seen in the state of Maine. Um, uh, I mean, the trail system people are ner nervous because they know there will be some landowners, you know, as I say, my test is 14,000 miles of snowmobile trail and 8,000 or 6,000 miles of, uh, of ATV trails in Maine that re rely on private landowners. It's not going to take too many of those landowners who are upset to say, get out, and that's the end of a trail network. So, uh, but we were, we were told by several legislators that that's not going to happen, that people, I don't know why anybody would be upset. They don't have to do a thing, and you're going to have to wear orange seven days a week is what you're going to do. Tom, we have a question. Um, does the bill currently prohibit hunting on private lands? The bill, the bills that are proposed would would allow uh, land. It would allow hunting if the on on the landowner's own land or any time or with written permission of the landowner. That's that's two of the three bills. And those are the ones that are really in play. The other one is every all private land north. Of, north of uh, Route 2 and Route 9. Interestingly, it does not apply to any public land. So there would be no Sunday hunting on public land. Hmm. I didn't know that. Um, and then Betty asked about um, the bill uh, ID. So um, that was one thing I wanted yeah, to let me give right you now. the numbers. I'll give you the LD numbers. Well, I I'm gonna ask everybody to go to our legislative action page. All the bills are um, on, on that page with the numbers and Tom's testimony is on there against the uh, three bills. So I'm putting that link in a, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I gotta do it again. Uh, I'm gonna send it to everybody on chat. Okay. Anything else on Sunday hunting? I mean, it's, if you really don't want this, it's, you should be contacting your legislator. This is gonna be a fight. So Tom, what's the, what's coming up for that, for that Bill. I mean, we next, had the next week. There'll be a work session at the I F N uh, the I F N W committee. They I don't know what they'll do, whether they'll vote next week or not. Um, but it will likely go to the full chamber by the middle of May. Would be my guess. Okay, week. so we will um, we will be keeping people up to date um, through email. If yep. anything, if we need anything, any test, any letters to their representatives uh, probably we should you know anybody should be communicating with their legislator anyway on these on all these bills just to and let them if know. you don't know who your legislator is or how to contact them you're welcome to give us a call or you can you can go to the main main.gov website on the legislature and, and click on it and, that, it and put your town in where you're from and it'll tell you Came out. It'll tell you. Uh, also, that legislative action page, that link I sent out to everybody, and I'll send it out on email to this group, but we have a link straight to the legislative um, Senate and the legislature. Um, They're talking about Sunday hunting. Where, where you can another, find, uh, I'm going to meet you, Doreen. Okay. Um, where I can get, uh, where you can get that information about who you, your reps are. So we have... It, we have the calendar on there as well, so you can see uh, if any hearings are coming up. Um, Tom, remind me, are people, because we're, well, so much is virtual, um, do people, can people just uh, watch through Zoom or through the internet? 
Yeah, if you go to the, if you want to watch a hearing or actually the, 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 everything is recorded so you can actually look at, watch a hearing that has already occurred if you want. But if you go to the main, uh, the legislative website at main.gov, you'll, you'll see, a, um, you'll see, uh, it says YouTube channels, everything's done on a YouTube channel. So you can either, you can either watch it, you can watch it live or you can click on a post, a past session and, and, uh, and watch any, any session that's occurred because everything is taped. Great. So yeah, we'll probably, uh, you know, keep keep an eye on that website on that web page of ours. Um, I'll I frequently update it as soon as I get new information or things that are useful for members to know about. So keep it definitely keep checking on it. Janet, I see that you have land in Chesterville. You so you're in that. I believe you're in Senator um, Black's district as well. Um, even though you're in Connecticut, you own land there, you might, it would probably work, be worthwhile for you to check in with him. Uh, yes, Tom, I, I've been thinking about this because I'm not there, but I, would, I am opposed to this. Um, yeah, I, sending, him, sending a note, I mean, I, I think these legislators need to understand that there's opposition here. So, I mean, I, uh, I, I've got a poll for the committee that shows 75% of Maine residents are opposed. But, yeah. Oh, 75%, okay. Yep. Yep. Let me write that down. Um, what did you say his name was, please? Because I feel a little bit distant. You know, I'm not up there yeah. <clears throat> as often as I'd like to be. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's it Senator say. Russell Black. Russell Black. Okay. Yep. And Representative Landry is actually the chair, is the, is the House chair of the IFNW committee. So Representative Landry. I don't know if he covers... He does cover Farmington. I don't know if it's just, I don't know if he covers Chesterville or not. I see. Well, thank you very much. I would like to weigh in on that. Oh. Okay, I'll keep going. If you don't have any other questions on that, um, we have our, our roads bill. This is a we have a the old roads, the discontinued abandoned roads. There's nothing more complicated than discontinued abandoned roads, and uh, we've worked at that a lot. And I don't know if you have old, an old road on your property, but it's really kind of a messy situation and uh, the laws were well intended when they were put in place, but they are a mess and create all kinds of problems. So, so we have a bill in that, that got a good, it got a unanimous vote last year, but again died when the legislature adjourned um, that says if you, and so an abandoned road is a road that hasn't been maintained for 30 years and a, and a town can just declare a road abandoned um, and if the road is abandoned and a public easement is retained, the public can use the road, you own the road, the public can use it, and the public the, in the town doesn't have to maintain. It. That's the short version of it. But but the town can just declare a road abandoned. And if you disagree or believe there's been maintenance done to it by by the town, you have to go to superior court. There's no local appeal. So we have a bill in that would create a local appeal. If the town wants to declare a road abandoned, they have to tell people in advance. They have to notify the landowners affected. They have to allow for public input or public hearing if people want it. Um, and, and um, you know, it has to be done in a public vote, not just the selectmen just meeting and doing it without, without notice and those kind of things. And then it needs to be recorded in the registry of deeds because um, a road, abandoned road, a lot of the records are gone. And so roads can be abandoned or not. And so I won't go into the details of it because it's kind of complicated, but if you have an abandoned road or a discontinued road or an old road on your land, um, uh, you know, give me a call and I'll help you work through it. I, I help a lot of people on that particular issue. Um, and that's LD 596. LD 1407 is a bill, it's a right to practice forestry bill. <clears throat> and it would, it's a bill that would say, if a landowner, and it's modeled on the right to, right to practice, uh, far, uh, right to farm um, law in Maine. And it says if you are operating forestry operations in a in a in a in the customary way, that um, you aren't creating a nuisance, um, and you and it would um, it could prohibit certain uh, uh, local ordinances that regulate certain forestry activities. So the idea is. Uh, to, to create more standardization across the state and not have a lot of local ordinances that don't, don't necessarily 
uh, aren't really based in anything and they're um, going to prevent forest management from occurring. So um, I don't know where that bill will go. We supported the bill or the concept of it. There's a lot of work to do on that bill. I think it makes sense for certain things. Um, it has worked. The agriculture people have said it worked. Um, the administration, again, is in favor of this bill. Um, so there's work to be done. I think there's a work session out next week. Um, so we'll see. Um, we'll see where that goes. But it, it could be helpful to landowners. It's not to, to try to lower standards or anything. It's simply to avoid some uh, prohibitions on on you know kind of a fully acceptable practices that somebody just doesn't like or they don't like the hearing the noise or or uh, things like that. So um, I think it can be a good thing for landowners, but we'll see where that goes. Um, I was waiting to testify just this morning on a, a bill that is uh, in that for the right to practice force bill is 1407. The, uh, there was a bill 1549, a forest advisory board, which would create an 18 member or 19 or 20 member board that would advise the, um, it would be a permanent board staffed by the main forest service to advise the department and the director on forest policy, appointed by the legislature, um, largely by the legislature. Um, we are opposing that bill because we think you know one big permanent board is not the place to do it. Uh, where the where we've seen a lot of success, I think, is is a temporary uh, task forces put together to look at specific issues and address them and then disband. And I've been on a number of those, and they work because you have the right people focused on the on a single issue. So, um, I that bill is being heard right now, actually, at the Agriculture Conservation and Forestry Committee. Um, the uh, administration is opposing the bill. Uh, as I say, I, I have testimony in opposition. If I get the, I don't know if I'll get to deliver it or not, but I've submitted it. But I'll put that up on our webpage. But um, I think it's much more effective. I mean, I'm, I'm on, um, I was on the wildlife uh, action plan for Fish and Wildlife, and we met for about a year with, a, you know, 15 or 20 of us. and and advise the department, but then we disbanded. And I'm doing the same thing on the climate council on how to see if we can get small landowners interested in climate, you know, some some way to get involved in carbon markets for small landowners. That we're meeting now and we'll disband in September 1st. So uh, that's a more effective approach and less cost effective. The states that have these big boards have, you know, three, four, five, six staff that staff the board. And um, I'd rather have the money spent by the department and the forest service on directing. Well, I have a question about services. that. Huh? So this is Richard. I have a question about that. So I, I looked at Bill. I didn't see that there was a specific place or designation that Maine Woodland owners even had a place. There isn't. There is a, there's 18 members, 18 members, uh, oh, 19, because they, because when they introduced the bill this morning, they said, we're going to put an angler on it, but there's no land, there's no small landowner represented at all on the, of, out of the 19 people. Yeah. So sponsor, I. Who is the sponsor I, of that? Uh, the sponsor is Maggie O'Neill. Maggie O'Neill. From she's South. The, yeah. She's the house chair of. She's the house chair of the ACF Agriculture Conservation Forestry Committee. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one of the more interesting bills is uh, I don't know if anybody talked about that, but any um, one of the more interesting bills is a bill dealing with. Um, dogs, interestingly, um, hunting dogs. And so Maine has a leash law, but there's an exemption for dogs, hunting dogs. And most hunting dogs aren't really problems because the dogs are, you know, uh, around the hunter and things like that. But there are certain um, do dog, uh, you can hunt certain game like bears and coyotes and bobcat and raccoons with dogs. And those dogs tend to be, those are hounds and they tend to run in packs and they, they, there's been some, a number of different problems where uh, even on posted land, the, you know, a dog, it's not illegal for a dog to, for someone to turn their dogs loose on somebody's posted land and have them chase after game. And uh, that's, there's nothing, there's nothing there that can be done for some of these folks that have had to deal with kind of packs of dogs running around on their land when they don't want them. 
uh, the hunter can't go, but they, uh, the hunter just waits, you know, waits until they get to a spot where it's not posted and, and catches up with the dogs. Uh, it's been an ongoing problem. A few years ago, they, we, we worked on some bills to limit the number of dogs in a pack and things like that. And they all have to have collars on them uh, that identify who they are and also uh, um, GPS collars, but that hasn't stopped the issue. So there is a bill um, that I was part of a group that worked on that, that is trying to narrow that down and basically say, if you turn a dog loose on a property, you know, is um, the landowner doesn't want you there. You know, you can, that is, that is a violation. Um, so it's a start on that issue, but it's been, it's not a widespread problem, but when it's a problem, it's been a huge problem for, for our landowners. So that one is, uh, that one is also pending with the legislation. And then the other one I would bring up is uh, there's a lot of issues around herbicides. I haven't engaged in those because we, our members don't use herbicides very often. And so, but there's a, been a lot of conversation, a lot about, you know, herbicides, and you probably have been reading a lot in the news, and it's very complicated issues, and and uh, a lot of time, a lot of time spent on that. Um, the other issue, the other item that's a lot of time is being spent on is on on carbon, carbon credits, carbon markets, climate change. Um, we are working on the lands that we own right now. We have created, we have. We own about 8,000 acres of land that's been donated to us, if uh, you may or may not know that, that we manage. And we, um, we have done an inventory of all our lands and the, you know, we know how much carbon there is. And we're looking at how carbon markets, how we might be able to play in the carbon markets, but also inform our members about how they might be able to be involved. And um, there is this group, um, I, um, I think I mentioned earlier in a conversation about, I'm on this carbon group looking at at the um, looking at how to involve smaller owners in in carbon markets, and we'll use our data to to uh, test some different systems. But and you'll be reading more about that in our newsletters coming up. But I expect there'll be some legislation around carbon, either carbon friendly practices for landowners, or um, you know things that you can do and get certain credits for, or some kind of incentive for, or some way to for to help land smaller owners work together perhaps to plan a carbon market. So that is a big, there's certainly a lot of, there's a big discussion going on around that. I mean, the forests of Maine um, store about 60 offset, uh, offset emission, about 60% of the emissions in Maine and the products that are produced from wood store another 15. So about we're 75% toward carbon neutrality in Maine just because of the forest. So it's a big player in the whole carbon discussion and um, it will be for sure in the next, over the next, this year and the, the next few years coming forward. So I expect to see quite a bit on carbon and carbon markets and climate relating to forestry. Um, those are the, those are the issue, those are the topic areas that I wanted to talk about. Do folks have questions about specific things or or topics or concerns about something in particular or anything like that. And anyone can unmute themselves, I guess, Jan, huh? Yep. This is Richard again. I got to, can I ask you a question about the herbicide issue? Sure. So why, you know, I'm not a big user of herbicides, but I occasionally use glyphosate on some invasives. Any of these bills going to, prohibit me and how could they possibly prohibit me from using it? The only prohibition would be from buying it, I guess. Yeah, most of the, most of the discussions have been around um, forestry regulations uh, for application in a, in a commercial setting. And then a big discussion around whether to ban aerial application of a herbicide. Um, and that, that's kind of an interesting thing because aerial is sometimes easier to control than ground. Um, but so there's a lot of discussion about aerial application of herbicide. But you know the homeowner buying at the at the hardware store a Roundup and spraying it. I don't know unless you ban the sale, which is highly unlikely. It's not. Um, 
it, you know, it's no way to deal with that. And you're right on invasive plants. It, it's almost impossible to just manually eliminate invasive plants. It's just that it's, you can keep cutting them back, but that, that's, it doesn't work over the long run. You got to do something different than that. Um, so Richard, I don't think it's going to, it's been, it's, if you listen, there's some great testimony on, on, uh, on herbicides and understanding. There's some really interesting toxicologists that have spoken in front of the ACF committee about uh, glyphosate. And, you know, it's, it's a way to educate yourselves on, on that. And, but I, I there's, there's going to be a closed vote, I think, on whether to ban it for commercial purposes. Thank you. For forestry purposes, still used in a lot of other venues. Betty. Betty, I think. I guess the Maine Audubon has been uh, has done a big uh, um, call out to its members and other organizations to oppose the uh, aerial uh, yeah. herbicide. So, yeah. so I called Scott Landry and um, hit and I. I guess I just would like to see what your opinion is. Uh, he, his uh, position, as far as I could gather, was that aerial herbicide is more direct and it can be zoned and um, more effective than if there's on the ground uh, machinery that loggers would take around and just um, that there would just be a lot more spraying into the into the uh, damage to the um, pollinators and other birds and things. So he's quite, seemed quite um, adamant that that aerial spraying was the way to go. So what, what, where do you stand on it? Well, we, as I say, we haven't, we have not as an organization engaged in it. I think there is some validity to the argument that um, aerial application is more targeted and, and, you know, we're, you're not exposing people to it as much because you're not on the ground, but it's also easier to make sure you've got it, you know, in right where you want it versus you're on the ground kind of spraying it and you're trying to, did I get that spot? And, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I think, I think that is valid. I think that is a valid point, you know, without judging whether you should use it or not, but I think that is a valid point. And that has been made at the, in the hearings for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, areas people want to talk about? Things they'd like to see that, they, that we're not doing on, on legislative stuff? It's the strangest session I've ever been involved in. I hope we don't have any more like this. Hmm. I hope it's back in person. And, you know, people talk all the time about lobbying, lobbyists having too much influence, but my experience has been. In, in the vast majority of cases, it's helpful because you know the, you you end up you know you end up having interactions with legislators on issues that they're not experts on, and they don't you know. And but now it's pretty hard. It's hard to have that interaction with, with them. Margaret, I think you you have a question. I had to miss the first half of this, so I, I'm not asking any questions. I just had an unexpected client come in, so. Um, <laughs> It, my first question is related to that. Can I view this later on? Has it been taped at all? Yes, yes. Okay. It will be up on our website, the entire thing. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is related to the meager portion that I've been mm -hmm. able to attend, <laughs> actually um, attend to. I mean, I, um, uh, and that is, um, when you speak of the um, overhead spraying, I know that there's been a fair amount of um, pesticide, not herbicide, overhead spraying for um, brown tail moth, I think, and others. And so they do have some experience with that. And I've heard the similar arguments with spraying for brown tail moth that it's very directed. But on the other hand, you do have um, some of the, um, I think it's the DMR. Um, who note the the effect on shellfish and um, when when you do, when you do some of that spraying along the coast? Mm -hmm. um, exactly, like are they 
spraying for they're spraying for exotics or what are they spraying for when they're spraying um overhead pesticide in a forestry, in a forestry set a herbicide in a forestry yeah. setting yeah it typically is it's used on essentially on um the most productive forest sites where you want to try to grow softwood trees because oh, and it it basically eliminates the competition for the because the the timing of a herbicide application is usually in the is late summer early fall and the softer trees have stopped growing by then but the hardwood trees have not so so you can spray and not kill hard softer trees but you can kill hardwood trees and so it's usually it, yeah so it's those um those beach stands and that yeah. kind of Right, it's the it's the old, it's the beach stands that have no value, but it might be a very productive site. And the landowner is saying, "Well, if I if I do this, I'll encourage softwood, or then I'll plant the, a softwood species on this, and and the growth, and I'll get my growth rates up." So it mm -hmm. makes it. So that's the you know that's the. I think there's. I'm trying to remember the numbers. I think there's ten to fifteen thousand acres a year sprayed. I think that's the number, but I'm I, I mean I've been watching the hearings, but I'm not engaged in them, so. You know, I'm, I'm, for my own information, I'm watching it, but, mm -hmm. um, but you know, spraying with a uh, brown tail moth is a kind of a different thing because you're in a, you know, in a forestry setting, you're trying to pick the spots that are way away from other things. You know, you're not trying to spray near water and things. You're trying to get these productive lands that are away from everything. So if you're spraying brown tail moth, you're, you know, you're, you're where it's, where it is. And so you don't yeah. have a choice. You get, you, you know, you're going to spray where the moths are and that could be, near streams, it could be near houses. And, you know, that's a horrible public health issue, obviously. I mean, um, right. a lot I of people. Think. So yeah. it's, a hard, it's a little different, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I see. So, so when you spray for brown tail moth, you're spraying where the brown tail moth interact with people and therefore right. populated highly visible areas and along the coast. Right. Um, whereas right. the, this pesticide application is um, more for the logging industry and um, all right. mm -hmm. you're, you're able to pick the spots in forestry with brown tail is wherever the brown tail moth decides it's going to show itself. And in mm -hmm. forestry, you're picking the spot. So mm -hmm. it's a little different, but you know, the, you know, this is the same idea. Um, mm -hmm. still, still have to be careful. And I don't know what they spray brown tail moth with. Uh, I don't know if it's a, or if it's a, like a BT form? I don't know if it's a BT. I don't know either. I don't. Or, I know it one. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I if you care about this, I would say the one thing about Sunday hunting is if you care about it, it would be great to to engage in that with your legislators because that is going to be an issue for absolute for sure. One thing um, that we are doing on that front as well is engaging with users of other uh, non-hunter users. Um, so we had an article in our newsletter in May, for the May edition about, um, from uh, the, what is it? The president of the guide association, Maine Guides Association um, and bringing that perspective that, you know, this relationship between users and landowners is pretty sacred. And uh, I think it's, it's an important concept. And the landowner has, um, you know, in the, in the article, the guide who wrote it said that landowners are doing, they're going above and beyond making their land available for all the uses that are, that, that people are using it for. And so I think that if we, as an organization, I think we're really focused on um, wanting to shine that a light on that. And we, I think we have over the years, and I just think we should do that more and more, that it's a, a wonderful thing that the landowners are, you know, <clears throat> willing and able to keep that land open for, for folks and to keep that relationship strong is, is, is key for us as an organization. So as part of that, and I just want to also mention that we are um, ramping up our in-person events and our programs um, on our properties and, and also for members uh, who like to have people on their property to, to, to do tours. We're going to try to do more of that 
Um, I think COVID has really created an opportunity for us to reappreciate the land that we do have that's available to us. I think we had more inquir inquiries about our lands and using them for hunting or for other, other activities, probably more than we've had in the past. So we know the role we play as, as the landowner having over 11,000 acres in Maine. So everybody here is, uh, you know, if, if whoever owns land is in that same, in that same club, it's a, it's a great service. Um, I, I, hi, I had a quick question. Uh, is there a, a date, is there a set date for this vote uh, uh, on the Sunday hunting? And also has the organization uh, written a letter um, to the legislature about how we feel or are we so uh, diverse in our opinion that um, that, that wouldn't be appropriate? Um, the set date, there is no set date yet, but they will okay. deal with it before they adjourn. Um, and um, I, they will probably, within the next week or two, whatever is going to come out of the Fish and Wildlife Committee will come out of it to go to the full legislature. And then I the see. full legislature will vote on it, I'm guessing, sometime in May. Um, I testified in opposition for the organization, and I am very confident that the vast majority of our members are opposed to this. They're not necessarily opposed to hunting, they're opposed to this issue. Um, yeah. And so uh, that is on the record in front of the committee and it will be given to, and there will be a, a work sent to every single legislator, including the group work from the other groups that are working with us on this issue. So we're not alone on this issue. The farmers are in the same boat as we are, um, strongly opposed. Yes. Thank I have you, a, Tom. Thank okay. you. I have a question associated with the Sunday hunting as well. I live in Bar Harbor, so of course I benefit from no hunting at all, which is both a benefit and a curse. The curse being the Lyme's disease that is so prevalent around here. But the, um, but the benefit is that we can go out at any time um, and enjoy the surroundings anywhere on the island. And the only hunting that's allowed is um, duck hunting, um, fowl hunting on Mount Desert Island. But the, um, uh, I've read quite, it, you know, I, I'm from Southwestern Maine, um, the Bridgeton area, Sebago, um, Portland. And uh, um, the, I, I, uh, the reading that I've done about this change in legislation to allow Sunday hunting I haven't seen any discussion about um, changing the licensing. Uh, you know, at this point, we have a herd of deer that is able to maintain itself with six days of hunting and only one holiday day or, you know, weekend day of hunting. If we double the weekend days of hunting, we'll have much more success, I would imagine amongst the hunters and what will that do to our deer herd and what is the legislature, what is this particular proposal um, that would bring on Sunday hunting um, proposing as far as numbers of licenses is concerned and doe licenses is concerned, that kind of thing. Are they, are they taking that into account? Um, I don't think the people that are proposing this are thinking about that they're trying to get something passed and uh, the department did testify um, that uh, you know uh, if if you could hunt on Sunday that Saturday is by far their visit you know the busiest day of hunting and if you add mm -hmm. Sunday down they'll have you know significant num you know uh, pressure on those days yeah they did, they did also say they that uh, one of the arguments for hunt uh, Sunday hunting is that would recruit you know we're losing the number of hunters is declining and the argument is, well, we need more hunters. Well, they actually testified that there's no evidence that you would actually increase the number of hunters. Um, you may spread, you may group them up more, you know, on the weekends and things, but you're not going to going to attract a whole bunch of more people into the, into the, uh, into hunting. The interesting yeah, yeah. thing about deer hunting is um, most people don't know, but the bow, there's a bow season that starts in parts of the state in the middle of September, 
Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and it runs and the, between bow hunting and regular firearm and then mus musket, uh, uh, mu muzzle loader, you're into middle of December. Mm -hmm. So from middle of, if you're a deer hunter and really want to hunt deer, you have to, you know, if you're a bow hunter, including a bow hunter, you're September, middle of September to middle of December is when you can mm -hmm. actually hunt deer in the state of Maine, which is a very long season. Yeah. Do we have the numbers about the success rate? How many, how many licenses we issue versus how many deer are taken yeah they, the department certainly would have that mm -hmm. um i mean i know last year with i know last year the number of deer shot uh killed were you know up significantly from last from in the past uh, yeah. but they were trying to get their they're trying to get the numbers down mm -hmm. the other way you do it is obviously there were people that could uh, sh they call it harvest harvest more than one deer so Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, and I, you know, I just asked these questions because yes, it does, uh, it, the, the number of hunters who come into the state um, would improve the economic position of the state, um, uh, improve kind of like the tourism aspect of things. But the, um, but it's not only the numbers that would have an impact on the herd, the numbers of individual license, licenses or individuals who come into the state. It's also the success rate of those who have licenses, right. I guess, you know, because they would have double the amount of time, they double the amount of weekend time right. to hunt. I, you know, some states, I think like New Hampshire has Sunday hunting, but they only have, I think they only have, a, they only have like a two week season, I think, or something like that. They have a much shorter, you know, one of the advantages of not hunting on Sunday is you have a longer season. You, we've seen a lot, you have a longer season. And as some hunters have said to me, you know, if it's a, if it's a really lousy the set day on a, if you've only got a two week season and it, and it pouring rain on one of the Saturdays, then you're, and you're only hunting on Saturdays, you're down to one day. In Maine, you have four or five Saturdays. So if weather is lousy one day, you can say, okay, well, at least I'm going to have more chances. So that actually making it a wider range of time has actually been beneficial for it is many hunters think that's beneficial to them as opposed to compacting it all in, into a short mm -hmm. period of time. We'll see. Mm -hmm. And the I'm department sorry. also said they're gonna have that, you know, there's a there's a management issue for them. I mean they they've got their game wardens, you know, they try to schedule their timing so that um, Sunday is the day they can either, you know, they don't need as many, obviously many people on, or they need, or they, you know, they kind of catching up with other things and they won't have that day. And, but they're going to still have to, they're still going to have to enforce the hunting laws seven days a week instead of six. So they're going to have to deal with staffing issues and those things. Mm -hmm. it, I, I'm sorry to uh, uh, ask so many questions, but one other final question. Uh, a follow-up question is, did you say that you ab have advocated for the hunters or for expanding into Sunday um, just now? Why? Yes. No. No, okay. Mm -hmm. No, okay. no, I mean, I, no, I'm yeah. a, I'm a, I, I grew up as a hunter. I mean, I'm a, I mean, I'll confess I, I'm a hunter, but, mm -hmm. but I'm also a landowner. And uh, no, we have, this organization has opposed Sunday hunting. We have supported opportunities for hunters. I mean, we've been supportive of hunting. Yes. That's the question. You know, we're not opposed to hunting and we're mm -hmm. opposed to reasonable people on, on the land. Mm -hmm. And we have actually supported some expansion of some hunting opportunities, um, mm -hmm. you know, for people, but we have never supported something. I, I like the, um, the argument that the, that small woodlands owners has put forth that um, you'll have more people who prohibit it altogether if they don't have access to their lands on Sundays. I, I was told I was incorrect by some legislators okay. that that would not happen. And I said, not many people are gonna post no, sun, no, Sunday, no Sunday hunting. Um, you know, the, the other thing right. I said to people is, you know, this the day you can walk out in your woods and, you know, without having to wear orange. And I said, I wanted to say, well, are you, if this goes through, are you gonna feel comfortable having your kids or your dog or something walking around the woods on a Sunday? Nope. Even though on your own land, it says, well, I didn't get permission, nope. so there can't be anybody here. Nobody's going to, you're going to wear orange. Yep. It's the and one, it's, talk loudly and do all the things that you do when you right. think that you're in the woods with someone with a firearm, you know. I mean, it's pretty scary, I think, personally. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the one, I mean, it's not horrible. It's not enough right. to keep you. No, I mean, it's actually, you know, there's not that many, there aren't that, thank, thankfully, there aren't that many bad situations, partly because right. I think a lot of people avoid those days. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, a lot of, if that's not well understood, then a lot of people change their own behavior to avoid being in the woods on those days. That's right. But they go, they can go on the day they know they're not going to run into somebody. Mm -hmm. so, and hope that after sunset, uh, people aren't still walking home. <laughs> yeah. Right. There's mm -hmm. been unfortunate situations like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's a question about uh, can a landowner post no hunting anytime? Yes. A landowner can post no hunting. Uh, you know, the, the yellow no trespassing signs usually say no nothing. I mean, they list off nothing. You can say no hunting, but you're welcome to walk or something. You know, it can be, you can, the other question I get is, if you say no hunting, can you hunt on your own land? And of course you can. I mean, it doesn't apply to you. You're not posting your, you know, you're prohibiting yourself. Um, but yes, you can, you can post no hunting. The other thing about posting though, is the statute, it does, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think that it does tell you exactly how you have to post. You can't just like put a sign next to your driveway and expect people to know or respect that. Right. Um, you know, there's, you have to, it's certain distances between each sign and it's pretty frequent. And that's why you see. Uh, a hundred feet. It's a hundred feet on a, on a, on a, like on a public road is, is, mm -hmm. but there's also a provision that says, so the hundred feet is like the automatic. And then it, there's a provision that says, or, or is likely to come to the attention of the person. So mm -hmm. you could still prosecute somebody who, if you only had one sign and you have it, it say they, they walked right by the sign. I mean, people get prosecuted for, you know, they drove, they drove by the warden says you drove right by the sign and said, don't, you know, I don't, you don't need any more signs than that. You know, you, you, you had reason, you should have seen, you saw that sign and you ignored it. So that, but, but that's a little harder. You have to say, you know, the person did. And the other thing that happens usually is the first thing a person does is rip the sign down. Cause if you rip the sign down, then you can say you didn't see it because it, it wasn't there. And then if you get caught, you can say, well, I won't come back. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. The other mm -hmm. way to post your land is purple paint. And purple paint in a certain way, uh, it's, a, it's a certain color purple and you can put it on your trees and that means no, that means access by permission only. You cannot set foot here without permission. Oh, wow. Purple I didn't paint know. on your trees. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we and you can send specific letters to specific people. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. If a, if you don't want a particular person, you can tell them. You can tell them even verbally. But if you give it to them in writing, mm -hmm. uh, if it gets to that, you usually end up with a law enforcement officer telling the person or delivering the letter, and then there's mm -hmm. no question. After that, you know, a mm -hmm. law enforcement officer will testify. Uh, yeah, this person knew. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anything else while I'm on? We're about one minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, just to, uh, if anybody has further questions, they can email you, Tom, or do they, you want me to? Yeah. Give me a call or email me or whatever, whatever is useful. Okay. Anytime. And then if we do need uh, action um, from our members, we will be sending out an email to everybody with information about what, what's needed and how to help. And we will, and you, do you have a prediction how long this session is going to last? Is it going to last till June? Uh, I don't know. I mean, um, they got a lot of bills to deal with. And um, I, I, I don't know whether they I think you'll see a lot of carryover bills, you know, bills that will carry over to the next session. Um, so uh, I, think they, I think they will be done by middle of June, but they may end up having to come back. Or they'll carry them into the next session, mm -hmm. which would start when would they start in January. January, but I wouldn't be surprised if they have to come back at least once. You know, also, if you do um, communicate with your legislature, legislator, um, senator on any of these issues, let us know. Um, CC us if you're emailing them. You can, uh, you know, Tom at Maine woodlandowners.org or contact at that's that's a general email box or Jen J E N N at Maine Woodland Owners. It's good for us to know because uh, Tom does get 
pegged with these questions of, well, how do you know what your members want um, and what they're and knowing what our members, how they're communicating with our legislature is really important for us to know. Okay, thank you everyone for being here. And if uh, we see another need for another update, we'll, we'll, we'll set one up between now and June and hope to see you again at one of our events coming up. We have May events on our, email, on our website at May, uh, Mainwood, mainwoodlandowners.org forward slash events. You'll see all of our events indoor and out. So have a great rest of your day and um, we'll see you hopefully at the next event. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom right. and Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.